Forget roadside crossings. Go nowhere with guns. Go elsewhere your own way. Lonely and wanting, or stay and be early, next to deep woods. Inhabit old orchards. All clearings promise. Sunrise is good, and fog before sun. Expect nothing always. Find your luck slowly. Wait out the windfall. Take your good time to learn to read ferns. Make like a turtle, downhill towards slow water, instructed by heron. Drink the pure silence, be compassed by wind. If you quiver like aspen, trust your quick nature. Let your ear teach you which way to listen. You've come to assume protective color now. Colors reform to new shapes in your eye. You've learned by now to wait without waiting, as if it were dusk. Look into light falling, in deep relief, things even out. Be careless of nothing, see what you see. Philip Booth, How to See Deer The remaining four women have just found Shepard's boot and a trail of blood. Lena suggested Shepard could still be alive. This minute begins mid-sentence, as Ventress says, it's highly doubtful. Angle past Ventress on Lena and Raddick. Camera rises as Lena rises from her crouched position. Lena, we need to know. Angle on Ventress and Thornson. Lena just barely at left edge of frame. Thornson stares at the boot below frame. Ventress looks toward Lena. Beat. In the script, Ventress says, I'm not risking the entire mission. In the film, she simply says, Go. Go. Ventress starts to remove her rifle from hanging off her shoulder, and we angle on Lena and Raddick. Lena, fine. Lena turns to walk away. Angle from front as Lena cocks her rifle. Behind her, Ventress sets down her pack. Raddick remains motionless, and Thornson stirs. Thornson, I'll come with you. you. Reverse. The script says Lena glances at Thornson, but she has to turn halfway around to look at her. Beat. And the scripting here is interesting because we did not get the moment from the script of Thornson talking to herself last minute. Again, the script says, Lena sees something in her eyes. A slight sheen or glaze. Something not quite right. Lena, I'll go alone. In the script, she adds, quicker, quieter. In the film, she turns to keep walking. In second 15, we cut to a medium shot of Thornson. Her gaze is hard to describe. Angry. Confused. Suspicious. Even without the talking to herself, we should know that there is something slowly going wrong with Thornson. Second 19, exterior, swamp, day. A lot of thin vertical trees in the foreground, covered in growths that are far more like flowers than tumors. Mostly pink, some red, a few yellow. Camera trucks slowly left, and Lena comes into view out of the brush on the left. There is a subtle musical cue, a mark of something unnatural. The script says Lena heads through the swamp, gun raised, following the blood trail. We see no trail. We can only assume that Lena does. Second 26, we get an awkward cut to almost the exact same angle, but farther back as Lena walks toward camera, and another musical cue that is immediately more noticeable, going from a screech into guitar. Lena keeps walking angling toward camera, and camera dollies backward. There is something man-made at the far left side of the frame, like a spent but unexploded missile with two white stripes and one red, perhaps a remnant of one of the earlier expeditions, or soldiers from Fort Amaya fighting something. Or maybe it's not a missile at all and it is not even supposed to be in this shot. The script says, from somewhere nearby she hears a noise. But second 38, we cut to a tracking shot through the brush, and we hear the sound. The script suggests, perhaps the bear, perhaps something else. 
Camera trucks along with Lena, coming into view out of the brush, moving right to left. In the script, she freezes, looks into the trees. There is movement in the foliage. Something could be out there, a creature or person, or equally it could be a trick of the light and shadows. We do not see this. We remain angled on Lena. Lena watches, waits, the script says, but we angle from her right, a medium trucking shot. Lena sees something. We have to wait as Lena passes in front of camera, cautious, and crouches. The script says, but it's not the bear. It's a deer, or a deer-like creature. Elongated legs, branch and leaf structures flowing out of its back. It is white like the gator, and the branch and leaf structures it has instead of antlers are not immediately obvious, as it has its head down, eating. Lena takes aim. Camera lowers to be even with her. The deer is centered in the right half of the frame. Just as we might notice that there are colorful bits in its antlers, we cut, second 48, to reverse. Lena, crouched, rifle aimed at camera. An echo of her targeting the gator, except she does not fire. Behind her is a tree with yellow growths. Off to the right is a tree with pink streaks on it. To the left, bright blue and red flowers stand out from the overgrown grass. Lena lowers her rifle and looks, and we reverse. Angle on the deer, without Lena in the frame now. And like the Generation 5 dual-type normal grass Pokemon Sawsbuck, introduced in a connoisseur's revenge, this deer has flowers growing out of its antlers. According to Bulbapedia, Sawsbuck may owe its appearance to a barren Munchausen story, or the real-life Pear David's deer. The Surprising Adventures of Baron Munchausen, Chapter 4 Quote, You have heard, I dare say, of the hunter and sportsman Saint and Protector Saint Hubert, and of the noble stag which appeared to him in the forest, with the holy cross between his antlers. I have paid my homage to that saint every year in good fellowship, and seen this stag a thousand times, either painted in churches or embroidered in the stars of his knights, so that, upon the honor and conscience of a good sportsman, I hardly know whether there may not have been formerly or whether there are not such cross stags even at this present day, but let me rather tell what I have seen myself. Having one day spent all my shot, I found myself unexpectedly in presence of a stately stag, looking at me as unconcernedly as if he'd known of my empty pouches. I charged immediately with powder, and upon it a good handful of cherry stones, for I had sucked the fruit as far as the hurry would permit. Thus I let fly at him and hit him just on the middle of the forehead between his antlers, it stunned him, he staggered, yet he made off. A year or two after, being with a party in the same forest, I beheld a noble stag with a fine full-grown cherry tree above, ten feet high between his antlers. I immediately recollected my former adventure, looked upon him as my property, and brought him to ground by one shot, which at once gave me the haunch and cherry sauce, for the tree was covered with the richest fruit, the like I had never tasted before. Who knows, but some passionate holy sportsman, or sporting abbot or bishop, may have shot, planted, and fixed the cross between the antlers of St. Hubert's stag, in a manner similar to this. They always have been, and still are, famous for plantations of crosses and antlers. And in a case of distress or dilemma, which too often happens to keen sportsmen, one is apt to grasp at anything for safety, and to try any expedient rather than miss the favorable opportunity. I have many times found myself in that trying situation. End quote. Taking St. Hubert's stag as their logo, Jägermeister.com recounts simply the story of Hubertus. Quote, Hubertus lived in today's France and had a great passion, hunting. Unfortunately, he had little sense of responsibility and would go deer-stalking unscrupulously, greedy for prey. That all changed on one excursion when an enormous white stag came out of the forest underbrush, approaching him. It carried a glowing cross enthroned between its antlers. Hubertus was awe-inspired. Recognizing it as a sign from God, he vowed to better himself. From that moment on, he stopped hunting and joined the church as a missionary. According to legend, he was appointed Bishop of Tongern in 705. Around 717, he moved his official residence to Liege in Belgium. There, he commissioned the building of a cathedral and was known for his benevolence. Soon, the residents of Liege appointed him the city's patron. On 30th May 727, Bishop Hubertus of Liege died. To this day, he is still considered the patron saint of hunters. End quote. SaintHubertClub.co.uk offers more depth. Quote, Hubert was the eldest son and heir apparent of Bogus slash Bertrand, Duke of Aquitaine. 
Bertrand's wife is variously given in hagiographies as Hugburn and as Afra, and sister of St. Oda or perhaps Oda herself, the uncertainty being a mark of the low rating accorded women in Merovingian culture, where kings fathered heirs upon peasant women. Modern genealogy often lists Auda or Oda as a wife of Bertrand and mother of Hubert's brother, Udo. As a youth, Hubert was sent to the Neustrian court of Thuderic III at Paris, where his charm and agreeable address led to his investment with the dignity of Count of the Palace. Like many nobles of the time, Hubert was addicted to the chase. Meanwhile, the tyrannical conduct of Ebroin, mayor of the Neustrian palace, caused a general emigration of the nobles and others to the court of Austrasia at Metz. Hubert soon followed them and was warmly welcomed by Pippin of Heristal, mayor of the palace, who created him almost immediately Grand Master of the Household. About this time, 682, Hubert married Floribon, daughter of Dagobert, Count of Leuven, a great and suitable match. Their son Floribert would later become Bishop of Liege, for bishoprics were all but accounted fiefs, heritable in the great families of the Merovingian kingdoms. His wife died giving birth to their son, and Hubert retreated from the court, withdrew into the forested Ardennes, and gave himself up entirely to hunting. But a great spiritual revolution was imminent, on Good Friday morning, when the faithful were crowding the churches, Hubert sallied forth to the chase. As he was pursuing a magnificent stag, or hart, the animal turned, and as the pious legend narrates, he was astounded at perceiving a crucifix standing between its antlers, while he heard a voice saying, Hubert, unless thou turnest to the Lord, and leadest an holy life, thou shalt quickly go down into hell. Hubert dismounted, prostrated himself, and said, Lord, what wouldst thou have me do? He received the answer, Go and seek Lambert, and he will instruct you. The story of the heart appears first in one of the late legendary hagiographies, Bibliotheca Hagiographica Latina, numbers 3,994 to 4,002, and has been appropriated from the legend of St. Eustace, or Placidus. It was first attributed to St. Hubert in the 15th century. Be that as it may, Hubert set out immediately for Maastricht, for there Lambert was bishop. St. Lambert received Hubert kindly, and became his spiritual director. Hubert now renounced all his very considerable honors, and gave up his birthright to the Aquitaine to his younger brother, Oda, whom he made guardian of his infant son, Floribert. Having distributed all his personal wealth among the poor, he studied for the priesthood, was soon ordained, and shortly afterwards became one of St. Lambert's chief associates in the administration of his diocese. By the advice of St. Lambert, Hubert made a pilgrimage to Rome in 708, but during his absence, Lambert was assassinated by the followers of Pippin. According to the hagiographies of Hubert, this act was simultaneously revealed to the Pope in a vision, together with an injunction to appoint Hubert Bishop of Maastricht. He distributed his episcopal revenues among the poor, was diligent in fasting and prayer, and became famous for his eloquence in the pulpit. In 720, in obedience to a vision, Hubert translated St. Lambert's remains from Maastricht to Liege with great pomp and ceremonial, several neighboring bishops assisting. A basilica for the relics was built upon the site of Lambert's martyrdom, and was made a cathedral the following year, the sea being removed from Maastricht to Liege, then only a small village. This laid the foundation of the future greatness of Liege, of which St. Lambert is honored as patron, and St. Hubert as founder and first bishop. Hubert actively evangelized among the pagans in the extensive Ardennes forests and in Texandria, a district stretching from near Tongeren to the confluence of the Wall and the Rhine. Hubert has died peacefully in Fura, Brabant, 30th May, 727, or 728. He was first buried in the Collegiate Church of St. Peter, Liege, but his bones were exhumed and translated to the Benedictine Abbey of Amdan in the Ardennes in 825. The abbey became a focus for pilgrimages until the coffin disappeared during the Reformation. His feast day is the 3rd of November, probably the date of the translation of his relics to Amdan. End quote. But this small deer Lena sees does not have a cross in its antlers, and it does not tell Lena she will soon descend into hell. Instead, it has flowers and remains silent. Regarding Pear David's deer, Matthew L. Miller, writing for Cool Green Science, 23rd September 2013, explains, quote, By the 1860s, the Milu, as it is known in China, was already, to put it mildly, close to extinction. The one seemingly viable population was in the Emperor of China's Imperial Hunting Park, a large, walled, and carefully guarded preserve. It seems an early version of the forest conservation that has become the norm for many wildlife reserves and national parks around the world today. Fence the animals in and keep the people out. When animals are rare, think tigers or rhinos, 
it is an appealing, if last-ditch, option. But there's a big problem. A small, isolated reserve is essentially an island, and animals on islands frequently disappear. A small, isolated population is more prone to being wiped out by weather, disease, predation, and dramatic change. Conservation biologists know this as island biogeography. The isolated Pear David's deer population was seemingly well protected by the Emperor's finest guards, but the deer was soon to become a poster child for the harsh lessons of island biogeography. It may well have disappeared, but luck intervened. Its escape from oblivion seems as likely as winning the lottery without buying a ticket. Here's the story. A French missionary, Pear, father in French Armand, David, had heard about this deer behind the guarded walls of the Imperial hunting grounds. A devoted naturalist, he had to see the deer. Just had to. If you're reading this, I suspect you understand the urge. One obstacle. This reserve was so carefully protected that no one was even permitted to look into it. But Father David wouldn't give up. He asked the guards to let him take one little peek. What could that possibly hurt? They agreed, but he could only look once. One glance, and he was done. This may be the only instance in history when breaking a wildlife law saved a species. At the very moment Father David glanced into the reserve, a herd of deer came strolling past him. And not just any deer. This species had a long tail and weird branching antlers unlike any other. Father David recognized what was clearly a species new to Western science. He then devoted himself to securing specimens. He eventually did. This led to a minor craze among European countries seeking live animals for their zoos. They got some deer after various diplomatic efforts. In the meantime, the Imperial hunting grounds proved to be not such a fortress of conservation after all. First a flood came through, drowning some deer and freeing others that were quickly eaten by starving peasants. Then came the Boxer Rebellion, which resulted in troops storming the reserve and eating every last deer. A few isolated individuals may have hung on outside the reserve, but it was clear the deer was finished in its native land. But Father David's chance encounter meant there were still deer in European zoos. Realizing these were the last of the species, they relocated an entire herd to the Duke of Bedford's spacious deer park at Woburn Abbey in England. This was an island too, but the deer had plenty of room to roam and breed, which they did. They survived World War I, though barely. When World War II brought food shortages and bombs, the Duke decided to not keep all his deer in one basket, so to speak, and sent them to zoos in other locations. Today, the Pear David's deer is found widely in deer parks, Texas hunting ranches, and zoos. It's even been returned to small reserves in its native China. But it doesn't roam freely in the wild. You might say that today's Pear David's deer has become something less than a Pear David's deer. How did deer shape the land and how did the land shape the deer? That we no longer know. The deer's complex interplay with native plants, with marshes, with predators, these are lost to time. Today it is a carefully tended creature. It knows the grassy lawn of the British countryside it negotiates the corn feeders of a Texas ranch. It seems to do well enough, but it is not the animal it once was. I'd like to think that, at least once in a while, wandering in a game ranch in hilly Texas, a pair David's deer catches the whiff of a mountain lion, and somehow this triggers a reaction similar to when it once had to fear the tiger. If only for a second, it becomes prey again, shaped not by people, but by its own wild nature. Who knows? Maybe that ecological past has already faded. Maybe it is best suited now for the life of a semi-domestic creature. A brave new deer for a brave new world. Still, when I saw them on the grounds of Woburn Abbey, the park that saved them, I marveled at their long swaying tails and impossible antlers. I felt happy they were still sharing the planet with us, even if in a diminished state. End quote. The Milu has been a symbol of good fortune and spiritual superiority since Zhang Zia rode one into victory of the tyrannical king of Shang and helped establish the Zhao dynasty. For Lina, it is perhaps a surprisingly peaceful respite from the trail she is following. She is looking for Shepard, wounded and alive, or for Shepard's body. She is looking for a misshapen bear she saw mostly in the dark. But here, in this quiet moment, she finds a strange deer, part animal, part plant. In second 55, it turns out that Lena is looking at not one, but two of these deer, as a second one steps forward from behind the first. The second one is slightly darker, but otherwise they are identical, and they move almost in unison, foraging in the grass.
Together, the two deer stop foraging and raise their heads, looking directly at Lena, at camera, at us, and time runs out for this minute. We spoke. What was it we said? Wordlessly watching, he waits by the window and wonders at the empty place inside. is all we are. Annihilation.